Welcome. Today, I am in conversation with Professor John O'Halloran, Vice President for Teaching and Learning at University College Cork. And we are going to talk about the subject of the scholarship of teaching and learning and what that means for John. Now, in summary, the scholarship of teaching and learning is about integrating research, teaching and learning with the ultimate focus on student learning. So ultimately, we are looking for the evidence of student learning. John, you're Morning. most welcome. Thank you. And Maureen. can I start by asking you to talk about the scholarship of teaching and learning from the perspective of your own discipline, John? How did you in zoology integrate research, teaching and learning? Thank you, Mary. This is great to have this opportunity to have a conversation like this. Um, zoology is my discipline. And, and I suppose in some ways I'm lucky because it means that I can actually go into the field and 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 collect specimens, catch wild birds and handle them and take samples from them. So for me, really, research has always been at the centre of what I do as an academic. Um, and I suppose what I do is I take inspiration from working with students and, and helping them to construct new data. So typically when we're out in the field collecting data or even indeed in the classroom with my undergraduate classes, um, and I still teach them, even though I might be vice president, I still enjoy that. Um, they actually collect data and generate data. And I think that's just the richness and the, I suppose the inquiry that students are, okay. are generating new data. And I find it exciting myself. So that co-construction with students in the curriculum, in the field and in the laboratory, in my discipline. Okay. That, that's very interesting because one of the things we're always trying to do is to provide a taxonomy, as it were, of the scholarship of teaching and learning and what it looks like. And one aspect is, of course, to involve our students, as John has been saying, in the research and that they would co-construct that research with us so that the research is not only just research informed in terms of our discipline, but also, of course, research led by our students. Um, so, John, moving on then to your role, perhaps, as a Vice President for Teaching and Learning, what opportunities have you had to integrate research, teaching and learning in that role? I suppose, first of all, at, across the university, it, it's exciting to see the, the, the blend and the range of research-led teaching and learning that's going on in the university from students, even in my own discipline, actually, and my own fortress, publishing mm -hmm. pieces of work okay. at the final year thesis, right through to master's and PhD students. So the extent mm -hmm. of which, across the university, we have research embedded mm -hmm. in teaching and learning undergraduate, postgraduate, that's masters, diplomas, mm -hmm. certificates, right mm -hmm. through to PhDs. And to me, that's really important. Um, for me, in, in my current role, then, I think mm -hmm. the extent of which space, technology, mm -hmm. and, and a whole range of pedagogies are informed by the, the nexus of all of those uh, dimensions, if I could use that phrase. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing a significant amount of research in relation to teaching spaces. Um, okay. So we undertook a survey last year of 158 teaching spaces across the university. And the purpose of that really was to try and set a benchmark. And secondly, to gain a deeper understanding is whether currently we are fit for purpose in terms of how we might engage in learning with students. Um, so what, might, what does that actually mean in real terms? Mm. How much fixed furniture is there? How much can we move around? What's the size of the space? What's the configuration of the space? And we have a report on this and we can leave it on, on the website so yes, people can explore and see what happens there. And that, so the extent of the configuration of space, the extent of which that space is supported by technology, um, right. whether that simply is wireless or indeed the, the capacity mm -hmm. to deliver and receive mm -hmm. information into the system. And then finally, I suppose, is, is the, the, the comfort of that learning space. space. You know, yeah, because I, yeah. We all know that's really important in, in creating the yes. atmosphere, but also creating the flexibility. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that's a very interesting angle that we're now talking about, because you remember uh, when you began this course that the first thing we asked you to do was to think about the learning environment uh, in the very university in which you were teaching, but also then your classroom space, whether that's in the lab or the field work. And so it's interesting to hear John talk about that. So I suppose, John, we're saying as well, space isn't innocent. It's not not just no, a given, it, no. it's constructed, as you say. So could, could you tell us, John, some of the things that kind of surprised you in those findings? Or I suppose um, one thing that surprised me is um, when you look at, so I suppose what we're trying to do is to see where we might be. So we are where we are now. And, you know, we're a 170 year old university with some old buildings, some very modern buildings. So the extent of that mix across the university, does that support the teaching and learning mission? And, and in some sense, does it support the emerging pedagogies? 
the mm. space that we need to support that kind of spe- as it, teaching and learning. And I suppose when I look across the world, and, and I've of, always referenced Nanyang University, and, and we put a picture of this up, but Nanyang University opened a teaching space area last summer, um, $340 million. Uh, mm. Every room is circular. Mm. Every teaching space is circular. So the notion of this didactic delivery in a square head front down to the back you know, is not part of the future. Um, mm. Um, so I think what surprised me was how much space we actually have where there is flexible space in the university. Mm-hmm. I think 78% of the space we have is actually flexible. flexible of the actual yeah. space. But of course, when you look at that in terms of capacity and volume, it drops off very quickly because mm-hmm. we have a lot of big lecture theatres yeah. which have fixed space with a big capacity, mm-hmm. but not very flexible. But I think th- as mm-hmm. time goes by and we evolve those space, and I suppose if we have the ambition to be creative in what, how we might use space for learning, um, Simple measures, for example, in a, bit, a large lecture theatre like the Western Gateway building or the Bull, will be to have flexible furniture. Yes. Now, people throw their hands in their air and say, how are we going to do that? I don't know how we do it, but actually we need to find mm-hmm. a way to make it mm-hmm. cost effective, but also flexible enough for teaching. Yeah. And simple, also simple things like the extent of wireless that we have is, right. is not supporting the kinds of things we're doing. And PowerPoints, uh, mm. uh, we talk about technology in a moment, but all our students and our staff indeed need places to charge up their their devices and there's yes. a, a yeah. certainly a shortage in that space. Yeah. So a combination of technology, space yeah. and pedagogies. Space. Yeah. Space. Excellent, John. As I suppose for our viewers, I'd remind you of the fact that if you're here in University College Cork, you will find the vast array of spaces John is talking of. For example, in the seminar room in the library, um, all the furniture is on wheels. Um, I work there sometimes and it allows us then th- that flexibility to move around. And of course, what John is talking about in a way goes all the way back to the Knights of the Round Table and to that notion of circular space, which, of course, uh, we can thrive in much more because of trust and security and the fact that we can look at each other and talk Mm. to each other in that space, um, as well as the hierarchical space of the lecture, where, unfortunately, we end up looking at the back of the neck of the person in front of us. But all the same, of course, though the desk can move, the students can and certainly the lecturer can. So, John... um, Again, uh, I, I'm interested to hear you say, you know, that we have so much flexible space mm. with all of it. So mm. there is uh, plenty is of uh, yeah. opportunity for us. That, that's good. What I find so, is my reference point, Mary, and I, and I ask my colleagues, I say, when people say, well, how does this work? And I ask people to think of a primary mm. classroom. Think of a junior mm. infant's classroom today. Mm. And just think of how that's actually taught. Yeah. And you look into yeah. the room and, and you can visualise that you've got yeah. groups of young people sitting around benches. Yeah. They're not in the, okay, the teacher and the board are up there, but actually it's yeah. slightly to the yeah. side. Yeah. And I think that mm. that notion of being immersed in, in learning with the yeah. f- teacher yes. in the middle and the faculty together with the students learning yeah. together, to me, yeah. is that's what right. it looks like in the yeah. future. And yeah. it's exciting, you know. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, John, when, when you speak of what it looks like, because one of the things we have encouraged you to do uh, in the programme is to document your teaching spaces. That is to photograph them, to archive them, to describe them, to name in detail, for example, the number of people in the room, the way in which the furniture is constructed. And I know, John, that you have been making photographs of the spaces as well yeah, and that we you did. picture we them all. And of course, we have that as well in, in, our, in our own yeah. archive. Yeah, we actually took uh, the 158 <coughs> teaching spaces across the whole university. They're the ones that are sub to booking and yeah, uh, we had yeah. two photographs of every one of them actually which is yeah, absolutely yeah, right and yeah. you know that whole space yeah, for the yeah. faculty as well I think it's not it's not just even just the student I think it's the whole yeah, dynamic yeah. of the space yes. and how we try and, and I, optimize I think, that you know? uh, we'd encourage colleagues as well to look at that space hmm. uh, yourself and, and to, to uh, it gives you an idea of the range of spaces in which we work and again to bring that part together I suppose space is not innocent it's not just a given we have to choreograph it we have to set it up we have to construct it Indeed, we have to co-construct it with our students. So now, John, we move on. I, now that I have the chance to talk to you, um, I, I want to ask you as well about the project on learning outcomes that we did mm. together with some other colleagues like Declan Kennedy and others some years ago. And uh, again, this is a very, I think, key area because our faculty are, again, trying to name the parts, as it were, for the students in advance by saying by the end, uh, you know, of this module, you should be able to do the following. So, John, how did you find that experience of integrating research, teaching and learning? And again, I suppose, what came out of that and what surprised you about it? Yeah, I suppose the learning outcomes journey for me started about 2004. That seems mm-hmm. a long time yeah. ago now, but I think yourself and Anya and mm-hmm. others produced a book on, on learning outcomes mm-hmm. together with Declan Kennedy, who, of course, has been the real champion for learning outcomes. And I suppose the first thing for me um, in learning outcomes was making the implicit explicit. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it's no good me in my head thinking what I want my students to learn if I wasn't explicit about it. So that was the beginning of the journey for me to actually articulate out loud uh, and in writing what I expect the students to learn at the end of any particular uh, event or any particular class or particular practical. In terms of my own discipline, then so I would have in embraced it uh, immediately because I could see the logic um, in terms of helping me in my in my teaching and my learning, but also in the student learning, mm -hmm. and that also helped me to constructively align the assessments um, mm -hmm. that might be uh, seen either across the program or across mm -hmm. an individual mm -hmm. module. So in my own discipline, uh, we achieved this, and then as when I moved to the role of head of school, we examined the entire curriculum in zoology and ecology, and right across the whole program, in fact, and we just mm -hmm. looked to see if there was constructive alignment of, mm -hmm. of the assessments and learning outcome for the program. And then at the university level, uh, we did a project together um, to see the extent to which the constructive alignment actually happened at mm -hmm. the university level at the, across the programs across the university. Mm -hmm. And we got a really good, um, surprisingly, I suppose, yeah. in some ways, because yeah. it is a journey. It's not yeah. something you yeah. can just simply yeah. say, we're going to do learning outcomes today and it's all finished. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. we have to construct them. We have to make sure they represent mm -hmm. what we're really trying to seek mm -hmm. to do together with the assessment. And I was really quite surprised. Yeah. And again, we have a nice report that we might put on the, yes. on the module yes, support uh, for this yeah. resource, yeah. Uh, Marine, I think. Good. you know. Okay. <laughs> It's interesting here to hear John talk of constructive alignment, which is, of course, a concept you have been introduced to in the programme, uh, particularly in the light of John Biggs and his interpretation of teaching for understanding, whereby, of course, the performances of understanding and their ongoing assessment align and therefore pick up uh, the learning outcomes. So that would be a good opportunity, I suppose, to, to revise that. And uh, again, we will put up that report that John is speaking of so that you might have a look at it and see what we uncovered about learning outcomes at University College Cork. Indeed, in whatever university you are teaching or whatever third level institution, you might yourself investigate whether there are such documents for you. Now, John, again, while I still have you, as it were, um, I want to talk to you a bit about like technology, let's say, in the light of the integration of research, teaching and learning. This is a huge area for us and a huge challenge. Uh, and often, too, I suppose uh, it's easy to get carried away with, uh, with the tool, whereas we're trying to think mm. of it in terms of a means to an end of student learning. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, how, what you have, uh, I suppose, achieved there and how you're integrating research, teaching and learning from the perspective? perspective of the digital and the technological. Sure. So we started um, we started a journey in the university in terms of understanding, first of all, um, the extent to which students engage in technology and our faculty. So I'm a, I'm a great believer in evidence. I think that it's no, while it's putting your finger up and measuring something is fine. Actually, I'm much more interested in understanding at a much deeper level uh, what our capacity is, what our expertise is, what our confidence and competence mm -hmm. is, or, or, and is indeed of our, of our faculty. So the first thing we did uh, when I took over almost two years ago as VP was did a survey of our staff to understand the digital literacy, asked some very obvious questions perhaps in terms of people's comfort in using technology in their teaching and learning, or not as the case may be, mm -hmm. what they were using, did they find it helpful, what were the surprises, what were the barriers, and we did a really nice report, uh, report on that to actually Give us a baseline. And we found there's something like 25, 26 percent of people are engaged in technology enhanced mm -hmm. learning. And I'll come back to that in a second. And then the 78 percent were had an ambition to do so. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really excited people mm -hmm. out there who want to embrace. Um, and it's about meeting the, the student on the journey. Um, mm -hmm. Our students um, are perhaps more digital familiar uh, or native is the mm -hmm. phrase of people mm -hmm. who use. Um, but I think that doesn't necessarily mean that they're mm -hmm. doing a lot better learning. Um, mm -hmm. So we have to meet them on the journey, on the, on the space where they are, whether that's in Facebook, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on, on Blackboard or wherever they, the digital domain that they're actually uh, engaged in. But also we need to bring them somewhere and also to say, mm -hmm. actually, this is how we will, what would like you to learn. Mm -hmm. So what we discovered is that uh, even though there's a great number of our colleagues interested in digital literacy, some people were unsure of the possibilities mm -hmm. or didn't really know how uh, we could develop this. So together with our new online manager, Tom O'Mara, and the team, we've been starting to build resources, uh, people resources and digital resources to enable our staff to actually go and see possibilities, share practice, mm -hmm. um, experiment, mm -hmm. uh, and try new things. And I think that the students are really getting excited about this. Faculty are getting excited about mm -hmm. this. And, you know, we, we're not doing MOOCs. Um, these are these massive open online mm -hmm. courses. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, we may do some at some stage, but at the, at the same point, we're on a journey of, mm-hmm. of, of development across the university, mm-hmm. which requires investment, but also requires investment in people. And mm-hmm. I think that's the really mm-hmm. exciting part, exciting actually. Part. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose you could say that th- this very programme is part of our experiment in trying to move digitally um, and technologically online to see how we might maximise, I suppose, the flexibility of learning for the staff. And I suppose, John, that is a key aspect. Mm. Uh, I've heard you talk about that a number of times, that providing flexibility flexibility, uh, yeah. you know, for our staff and, and hence, therefore, also for our students. And uh, I find that very interesting, as it, trying to come up with different ways of, of learning and of knowing now in the light of the digital tools at my disposal. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, certainly, um, when I when I worked in UC and I continue to work in UC, when I was off campus, it was often difficult for me to get to lectures either at weekend because I have children or, or there's other activities. So the fact that in the evenings I can switch on, come into a course, share a common space with colleagues who who are equally mm-hmm. wanting to learn in, in a shared space and a comfortable space actually mm-hmm. but also mm-hmm. perhaps a challenging space mm-hmm. which is kind of cool if you like mm-hmm. um, so I think that flexibility is critical actually um, because there's no point saying actually here's the timetable guys and if you can't fit it sorry that's not going to do any good mm-hmm. I mean I think we need to move beyond that yeah. our students expect mm-hmm. us to move beyond that and our faculty certainly expect and we yeah. have to meet people uh, yeah. on, on their yeah. needs you know yeah. Yeah. so I suppose the digital gives us in terms as well we have been speaking all along in the course about universal design for learning and this provides us um, uh, an online forum and the digital tools provide us with that uh, flexibility and with the diversity that we need in terms of our pedagogy but also in in terms of the different media that we can now engage uh, with in trying to engage our students. So I suppose, John, finally, we come to the idea of how you think of the scholarship of teaching and learning, you know, in the future and what you think perhaps the challenges are. And maybe you might have one message for for uh, the faculty who are viewing our uh, our conversation, hopefully, as to what you think they should think of in the future and where that future of integration of research, teaching, and learning lies for us. <laughs> Looking into the crystal ball, if you like, yeah. I'm not quite sure I'm good at any good at that. But I suppose what what's really interesting to me, um, I think about four or five years ago, I sat in the studio having a conversation with Grace Neville, and and I had a look at that video recently. And in some sense, the kinds of things I described there actually have, has happened. Um, and what do I mean by that? That the extent to which technology would actually start to become embedded in everything we we do. Um, I think we need to be careful. I think, you know, there's a whole, I've already referenced MOOCs, massive open online courses, and when they were introduced, everybody said they're going to take over the world, universities mm-hmm. would shut down, and we'd all go home, um, mm-hmm. and we'd all be excited and learning, doing all sorts of things. I, th- that has now changed, I think, and what really struck me um, was some years ago, so Udacity, edX, and others are the pro- great big providers, future learn of, of these online courses, and I heard them announcing this, saying, you know, please take our MOOC, but actually, we are also renting space in a local gym where you can all come together and have conversations about your learning and I said well actually we do that in the university and we've done it for 170 years Mm -hmm. so I suppose what it pointed to me was that and I promote technology I think technology is really really important there's actually no substitute for the contact Mm -hmm. there's no substitute for people meeting there's no Mm -hmm. substitute for exchanging ideas for challenging in the the flesh if Mm -hmm. I could use that phrase I think on the digital space you can experiment and you can Mm -hmm. experiment probably much more uh, liberally um, because mm-hmm. you can erase things and you can get away when the written paper is harder to get rid of perhaps but people on assessments and, and discussion boards can exchange ideas in a much more fluid way perhaps um, but I don't think the future is all going to be about technology uh, I think there was a time when people probably thought it was I don't yeah. believe that is the case so my my single message I suppose is let's try and meet the student on the journey mm-hmm. The student is going to, uh, and that, whether that student is a faculty member or, or an undergraduate or whatever they are, um, they want to learn and we want to learn. And I've learned so much from my own students. So I would say be open mm. to learning, mm. meet people on the journey and enjoy it. I mean, that's how I would say, it, you know. OK. Thank you very much, John. It's very interesting, I suppose, that the underlying metaphor of John's talk has been about the journey, the iterative nature of the learning process. And I suppose that takes us right back to the start uh, when in our first uh, encounter together, we looked at the tetrapod trackway in Valencia Island, which gives us that trackway of that tetrapod from 385 million years ago. So that's some journey. And what we want you to do is to document your teaching and your students learning in that subtle way so that you have your own trackway, your own journey. John, thank you. It has been a pleasure talking to you this morning. Thank you.